Hi, it's Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. Also, always, 1776.com. Today is August 24th, 2024. Let's revisit the death of Steve McNear and the death of his girlfriend Jenny. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me point out, viewers have told me about a show on Netflix. I have not yet seen it because I want my video to be independent of what's put forth in that show, right? I do plan on watching the show. If that show throws wrinkles I have not considered, then I might make a third video on the McNair death, right? For those who don't know, I made a video a few years ago on the Steve McNair case. I encourage viewers to look at that video. Now let's just go over the facts here. I've restudied the facts and let's give opinions on what happened, right? I understand. There's a podcast that says that uh, Steve's girlfriend was not depressed, that she was doing well. She was not concerned about the fact that Steve was seeing other women, right, other than her and his wife. I also understand that there's a private investigator who has a theory that uh, the wife uh, may have been involved uh, somehow. She had motive because um, her and McNair were having a rocky marriage. And the idea is that if Steve was going to divorce her, then there would be financial concerns and uh, she would have a motive to end Steve's life early, perhaps vindictively kill the girlfriend as well. Uh, out of rage. So let's talk about the case. Let's give a fuller context here. Right? Let me also encourage viewers to put their thoughts in the comment section of this YouTube video. It's really only because of your views that I'm making this follow-up video. Right? People found my email address, said, Hey Dwyer, have you thought of these things? And I thought, well, okay, folks are energized about this case. Let's revisit it. Now, McNair had a successful football career, right? This is a guy who won an MVP that he shared with Peyton Manning, right, in the National Football League. He's that rare National Football League MVP. Um, he got his team... To the Super Bowl. They didn't win it, but they won the AFC. He had four kids. He signed a $47 million contract when $47 million was a lot of money. Now, let me just say he has a wife. You've heard me just mention her. Uh, there are certain groups out there that seem to feel that she had some responsibility for McNair's death. Let's hit that contention head on here. In my opinion, the wife knows her man. She knows he has a roving eye. In my opinion, put bluntly, this is a Jackie Kennedy situation. Let me point out, the four kids, his wife is not the biological mother of two of them. Hubby leaves home sometimes late at night for hours, even on the eve of holidays. Note that he was killed at a condo he shared with friends. Now think about that. The family knew that Steve had a condo that he shared with other guys his age and older. Right? Folks, Let's just say the family was aware of who Steve was. Understand, Steve is killed very early in the morning on July 4th. Where is the father of four? On the first few moments of July 4th, 
Folks, he's with his 20-year-old girlfriend at a condo he shares with other guys. Right now, when his wife was asked about the 20-year-old mistress found dead with her husband, she said that she had heard of others, but not her. Right, folks, the wife knew. Steve was, we'll call it, a man about town. Right, just like Jackie Kennedy knew about JFK. Now, viewers should note that the 20-year-old that Steve died with was not his only mistress. He had a second mistress. Right, that's two mistresses and one wife. He spent time with the second mistress just days before his death. In other words, Steve's mistress situation, multiple mistress situation, was ongoing. Now, if, as some speculate, Steve's wife were to have decided to kill off Steve's mistresses, folks, let's be diplomatic. She would have had more than one woman to kill. Let's make another point and understand I'm a divorce lawyer when I'm not making videos here online. I'm a family lawyer. Now, prenup or no prenup, when you have kids with someone, even if the prenup prevents you from getting a windfall, your kids are going to get a windfall. You know, when I'm talking to clients who want a prenup prepared, I tell them, look, you understand that if you have children, that's going to change everything. We could even put a termination of spousal support jurisdiction in this prenup. Right? And recognize that if you have kids, you have a legal responsibility in the state of California and many other states to financially support your kids through the graduation of their high school class. Let me also say too that if your guy is Steve McNair and he owns a farm in Mississippi, he owns real estate, he owns a restaurant, he is the only quarterback to get the Tennessee Titans to a Super Bowl. He's the 2003 NFL MVP. Why would you want to kill the Golden Goose? Right? He's the father of two of your children. Right? You're living in the affluent part of town. Steve in Tennessee, so to speak, is a big man on campus. Right? He's going to be. After all, he is that Titan who won NFL MVP. Right? And so, just understand, I believe the fact that Steve's wife and Steve had multiple children the fact that Steve loves spending time with his kids. The fact that they're in Tennessee where Steve spent most of his career. He did play a couple of years in Baltimore as well. But he's in Tennessee where he is a king. Why would you want to kill him? Especially when he has investments. Even if your marriage to him were to end, you have kids with whom Steve is going to have a lifelong relationship. In other words, you want Steve to be as successful as possible. Now, understand, Steve loved his kids. He had complained to a member of his security team, a guy named Chris Wall, that his 20-year-old mistress Jenny would call him at bad times when he was with his family either with his kids, with his wife, or with his wife and kids. Right now, according to Mr. Wall, Steve wanted to 
distance himself somewhat from Jenny. Now, if you look at the timeline, the day before the marriage, I want to make this video as efficient as possible. The day before, excuse me, not the marriage, the day before Steve's death, a lot happens. On July 3rd, Steve is with his kids. You heard me say that Steve's close to his kids. Folks, he's with his kids. On July 3rd, when Jenny starts texting him. Now, in the text exchange, and I believe this is a major consideration, in the text ex exchange, Jenny says that she might need to go to the hospital. Right? She might need to get herself checked out. Folks, this is less than 24 hours before they're both found dead. Right? She also asked Steve for money. She needs the money to make a payment on the Cadillac Escalade, on which Steve co-signed. She also needs to pay her rent, and this is important. This is a fact many have overlooked. She needs to pay a higher rent because her roommate has moved out. Now let's get the timing right here. People owe rent early in the month. Some landlords will say, okay, look, it's cool as long as you get it to me by the 3rd or the 5th. Folks, this was July 3rd. She says, hey, look, my roommate moved out. That has changed her financial situation completely. She has a vehicle. She has a, a second vehicle. Right? The Escalade is just one of two vehicles she has. She has this rent payment. In addition, she's not feeling so good. So, let me say here too, her claim that she may need to go to the hospital in my eyes hints at emotional turmoil. It hints at someone who feels that they are mentally losing control. So McNair sends her $2,000. Now, the Escalade is also important. Because someone in the same color Escalade, I believe it's a black Escalade, had been following around Steve's other mistress off and on for several days. In other words, someone driving a car that looked a lot like Jenny's car was following around Steve's other mistress. Right? The driver had figured out who Steve's other mistress was and was driving around following that other mistress. Now later, on July 3rd, Jenny goes to work at Dave & Buster's, where she is a waitress. That day, she tells her manager, Sonia knew, here's the quote, My life is just, my word, S-H-I-T. Right? We'll just spell it out, S-H-I-T. And I should end it. Right, folks, Jenny's at work on July 3rd talking about ending her life to her manager. Now, at some time that day, during her shift, Jenny goes into the parking lot for a prearranged meeting with a guy who sells her a gun. Now, Let's just pause for a moment. Jenny is hard up for money. At least that's what she told Steve McNair. But yet she has the money to buy a gun. Folks, this is a young person with a plan. Now sometime that night, she wanted to go drinking 
with Steve McNair. Folks, this is days after she got busted for a DUI, where Steve McNair had to post her bail. Right, folks? Days. Later, she wants to go drinking with Steve. Steve turns her down. But he agrees to meet her at his condo that he shares with friends later that night. He texts her at 12.38 a.m., a little after midnight, now it's July 4th, to tell her he is on his way. Steve had a driver. Steve, Steve's driver says he dropped him off between 1.15 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. Folks, Steve's driver is the last person other than his girlfriend Jenny, who saw Steve alive. Right? A very short time later, police believe, McNair and Jenny were dead. McNair had been shot twice. Jenny was shot once. Right now, if you believe a third party shot them, understand that third party thought it out. Because had Jenny been shot twice, the murder-suicide theory wouldn't have held. But Jenny is shot once. It's Steve who shot twice. Also, if you believe that the guy who sold her the gun somehow is at the condo, right? No one has seen him. He's at the condo, and he shoots Steve, right? Just understand, Steve had a driver there just minutes earlier. Steve shows no defensive wounds. In other words, the police believe Steve showed up and fell asleep on the sofa. Steve doesn't have a hand up. There's nothing to suggest that Steve sees a third party and tries to protect himself. No, Steve looks like he is out cold on the sofa. He shot twice at close range. Now the bodies are not found for 11 hours. Wayne Neely, a Steve McNair friend who rented the condo with him, found the bodies. He then called another friend, Steve's business partner, Robert Gaddy, who called the cops. Now I know some are trying to make a lot out of the fact that the first call wasn't to the police. Right? I need for folks to think about what happens when you're renting a space with friends. Right? There's a business circle. Your friend might be known. Might be a former MVP of the NFL. Right? There is a situation where people do think about how is this going to come across in the media right calling the cops first is not going to help Steve who's been dead for hours or his girlfriend Jenny who's been dead for hours right the bodies are found they've clearly been dead for hours so just understand, Neely calls Gotti. I don't think that's a big deal. I think that's what happens when friends find another friend dead. And they panic a little bit. Let's also think this through a bit. You have a boy's playpen, basically. Right? Guys owning some swinging bachelor pad. Uh, Steve is married with children. Maybe that was a consideration when they found Steve's body. Maybe other guys who frequented that condo, anyone with a key, might have been living a similar life. Might have a wife. Might have kids. Might be fearful that their involvement with this condo might actually hurt their marriage, hurt their public image. Make them look like they're involved in some situation involving murder. 
I don't find the order of the calls to be dispositive of anything other than surprise and panic. Now, investigators believe it's a murder-suicide. They believe that McNair shows up and falls asleep on the couch. Right? As I said, there are no defensive wounds on McNair. He doesn't have a hand up. Doesn't look like he was in a scuffle. Looks like he was fast asleep on the sofa. The police believe that Jenny shoots him on the right side of his head. Right? He shot twice. She then sits down next to him and shoots herself in the right side of the head. The gun falls to the floor. Eventually, her body rolls off Steve and falls on top of the gun. Folks, I believe that's what happened. Right? Um, I don't have any reason to believe that the convict who sold Jenny the gun, maybe he texts Jenny a number of times. Maybe he tried to get with Jenny. She might have said to him, you know, this guy's dumping me. Right? He may have thought, hey, this woman is very attractive. Let me try to get with her. But just understand, it's a reach to believe that he would sell her a gun. Right? Show up at her workplace. Meet her clandestinely in the parking lot, sell her a gun, and then agree to go to Steve's condo that he shares with other people. In other words, other people have keys to the condo to kill Steve, and then would feel a need to kill the girl he's interested in. I don't understand the storyline that would cause the convict who sold Jenny the gun. He ends up spending a couple years in prison for being a felon in possession of a firearm. But I don't understand the scenario where he's supposed to have somehow decided to kill McNair and Jenny. Let me also say too, the fact that McNair, a professional athlete, right? He's still in his 30s. This isn't, you know, some old timer who's 68 years old. No, this is a athlete who's still in his 30s. McNair shows up late in the morning. We have a good source, right? Uh, late, shortly after midnight, McNair shows up at the condo. The good source is his driver who dropped him off, right? You're telling me McNair shows up and the police believe he's fast asleep. In other words, no sign whatsoever of him trying to duck away from a bullet, nothing like that. He shot in the head. It looks like he was fast asleep when it happened. Right? You're telling me that if McNair shows up and some guy suddenly comes out of the kitchen with a gun, right? You're telling me McNair is going to be found in the position where he's found? That's unlikely to me. That's extremely unlikely. Also, Let's think about Jenny's body. The gun's underneath her. If it's a third-party gunman, folks, that's going to take effort to put together, isn't it? Right? You shoot two people, then you think, you know what, I need to get rid of this gun. Why don't I put the gun under Jenny? So then you're going to lift her body then you're going to slide the gun under her. Then you're going to lay her back down on the gun. Then you're going to leave the place without leaving any forensics. That seems very unlikely to me. So, let me say this. Jenny has friends who have claimed in a podcast that she was not suicidal that she was not bothered with Steve sleeping around. I believe the evidence shows otherwise. 
She gets a DUI on July 1st with Steve and a friend in the car. Right, folks? That's just a few days before July 4th, the morning of July 4th. In fact, the early, early morning of July 4th when this happens. Right? She gets a DUI. She has figured out who Steve's second mistress is and has been following her around in the Cadillac Escalade that she just got. Right? Because Steve co-signed on it, I believe, in May. Right? So just understand, she gets the Cadillac Escalade, then she's following around the other woman. She texts Steve on the 3rd when he's with his kids, which we know from his security detail, Steve hated. She further tells him when he's with the kids, loaded news, that she may need to go to the hospital. Right, folks? That's the day before their bodies are found. She tells him, and I believe this is the key news, that her roommate has just moved out. Folks, we were all young once. We all had roommates, I'm sure, at some time in our lives. The roommate moving out changes everything, doesn't it? Right before you think to yourself, okay, my salary pays for this debt and pays for my share of this apartment. Now suddenly, you're short several hundred dollars. For a young person, that's a lot of money. Now she's telling Steve this on the third, the day before. They're found deceased. I believe she was under a lot of stress. Then, of course, she's at work. She's usually bubbly. Her supervisor claims she starts talking about suicide. Again, that's on the third, the same day that she buys the gun. Right? She's out in the parking lot. She buys a gun from this guy. So, I believe Jenny is under significant stress. She even wants to go out drinking with Steve. Steve must have realized she was a bit of a mess because Steve ended up going drinking with someone else. Right? But Steve turned her down but said, hey, we'll meet up later at my condo. So, folks, Jenny is falling apart. Right? Let me also say, too, the condo. Jenny feels a need to take the gun to the condo. According to reports, she's wearing romantic clothing. What's the gun doing out? Even if she, let's say, went to Steve's condo, and I'm guessing the condo was in a safe part of town. I couldn't imagine a guy signing a $47 million contract and then having a condo in some sketchy neighborhood. But let's say Jenny decides, hey, you know what? I need protection. Right? I'm afraid of getting mugged. Okay. She has the gun. She takes it to the condo. What's the gun doing out of her purse? What's the gun doing? She's in a negligee. She's thinking of, you know, seducing her man or at least giving that appearance. What's the gun doing out? The gun that she just bought. Then, of course, think about how they're found. Her body is positioned in such a way that people feel that she was initially laying on Steve and that she rolled off the sofa. Right? Understand, folks, this was someone who was troubled, who had just talked about suicide to a co-worker just hours earlier, less than 24 hours before this happened. Right? She talked about suicide. Then, of course, she's found 
in a position where the police believe she just rolled off Steve's lap, fell onto the floor, her lifeless body on top of the gun. That's what I believe happened. Now I will uh, gladly watch the Netflix show. Um, let's just say what I found is that you never fully know the whole story. I talk with people um, about their divorce and the tone of voice on the phone or in the Zoom call uh, will connote, you know, someone who's at peace with themselves, someone who's happy, someone who's ebullient. And then as I get to know them, you find out that that was a mask. The real person is upset, feels that they have spent five years, 10 years, 15 years in a relationship that didn't work out. Feels that the other person exploited them, took their best years, made promises they couldn't keep, told you you were special and then you found out some other woman was also special because she was also a mistress. Right, Steve, of course, had a public profile. Everyone knew, just like with Kennedy, that Steve was married, that Steve had kids. But these mistresses thought they were the one. Right, so just understand, the friends may not have known the side of Jenny that had her trailing the other mistress. They may not have known the side of Jenny that had her during a shift, taking a break, going to the parking lot to meet with a felon to buy a gun. They may not have known the side of Jenny that told Steve in text. I'm assuming the police have these texts, right? How could they not? Since we know what was in the text and both the sender and the recipient are no longer with us. Right in a text, she says, you know, I may have to go to the hospital. Right now, folks, if she's healthy enough to go to work physically, that tells me that she's talking about mental stress, mental trauma, everything just building up, DUI, roommate leaving, financial stressors. Right, this is while she has a job, right? Steve has to send her $2,000. It's July 3rd. If she doesn't get the money, who knows if she'd be able to pay the rent. Understand, Steve doesn't buy the Escalade for her. He just co-signs on the Escalade. I'm sure, too, he talked with her directly about not wanting to hear from her at certain times. On the third, he's supposed to be out fishing with his sons. I have no doubt that's a planned trip. Right, fellas, let's go fishing, right? May have mentioned it to his mistress. Yeah, I'm going to take the kids fishing on July 3rd. That's when she texts him about needing to go to the hospital, about needing cash right away. Folks, she is falling apart. She's making a lot of moves. Let me say this too. It sounds like she was a texter. Now there are a lot of texts, there are phone calls between her and the guy who sold her the gun. You get the feeling she's just chatty. Right? You know, some people would say, hey, I hear you sell guns. Um, hook me up. What's the cheapest that I can get a gun for? Right? Other people will tell you their life. Right? I can tell you, I've been on the phone talking to someone about their divorce. All I really need to know is date of marriage, date of separation, reason for divorce, reconcilable differences, kids, uh, assets, property division. That's it. But some will tell me how they met their wife. Right? Some will tell me what was said. No prenup, nothing in writing, nothing enforceable. But they'll take me through conversations, take me through years of the marriage. 
she may be that type of person. Right? Let me also say too, if the guy selling guns liked her, right? That's not that big a deal. <laughs> He's not the first guy I've heard of who runs into a woman in one context, right? It's like, hey, you want a gun? Sure. You know, here, here's a firearm. And then wakes up during the conversation and thinks to himself, wow, you know, this, this woman's kind of hot. She has it together. She has it going on. I'm attracted to her. You know, if she, you know, is ready to move on with her life, maybe I could move with her. I don't think that's a big deal. I think it's a leap to go from there to let me kill your NFL boyfriend. And then let me get nervous and decide to kill you because I can't afford to be involved in this crime that I foolishly agreed to be involved with. Right? So let me hear from you in the comment section of this video. No, I do not believe Steve McNair's wife had him killed. Right? He's out fishing with the boys the day before he's murdered. Even if you've signed a prenup, and I don't know whether she did or not, but let's say she signed a prenup, giving away some rights. Just understand that prenup doesn't go to child support. Right? It just doesn't. You know, if, if your kids have a multimillionaire father, who is still involved in the business game after he leaves the NFL, right? He's still involved in more than one business. You're thinking to yourself, wow, this is great. I want him alive, not dead. Because, number one, I want him to be a father to our kids, right? Our kids need a father, right? Number two, you know, he, he can... Show them the ropes financially. He can help support them. Right? The McNears lived in the good part of town. Steve was a guy who, quite frankly, spoiled his family. Right? So, no, I don't believe the wife killed Steve. In terms of mistresses, understand, if you're with a philanderer, and you understand that he's a philanderer, and the wife did. She told the police she had heard of others. You're not going to be thrown by the latest 20-year-old. You're just not. Even if he runs off with the 20-year-old, you're going to get child support. He's still going to be close to his kids. Let me say, too, you know, I understand that in addition to the guy who sold the gun and the wife, there are some who feel that Steve had a strained relationship with at least one business partner. Right? Some will also point to the fact that Steve didn't have his customary roll of cash when his body was found. Right now, what I want people to understand is his body is found 11 hours later by the guy he shares the condo with. It would not surprise me, and I have no evidence of this, but it would not surprise me if Steve owed people money, right? The friend looked, saw Steve's body, you know, dead, is thinking, wow, how am I going to pay next month's rent for this condo that I had with Steve? And then the guy, you know, takes Steve's role. Understand, Steve's buddy finds him, calls another buddy. It's the other buddy who calls the cops. Somewhere in all of that, Steve's bankroll, which he usually carried, right? It's cash, so we don't know if he had the roll or not that night. But let's just say Steve's customary bankroll was missing. That doesn't tell me simply does not tell me that somebody else came in in some kind of robbery and decided, hey, let me rob, you know, Nashville's Tom Brady <laughs> and take his money, kill him for the few bucks in this bankroll and kill his girlfriend. I don't believe that happened. 
So those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. I think it was a murder-suicide. I think Pat Postiglione and the others got this case right. That's how I see it. Tell me how you see it in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.